Well, anyway, thank you all for coming. Uh, any questions? <laughs> <laughs> What is your latest? This is, by the way, this is the next Dalai Lama. Dalai Lama. He said he was Dalai Laminate. That was good. What's that? Dalai Lama said he would be born as a Western woman next time. Really? Yeah, so. Here we go. Oh, so any questions? Oh. What is your latest realization? This darshan may be monitored for quality assurance. <laughs> 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 What's that? The drone. The drone. GBC drone. <laughs> what was yours? Does Krishna West have a mission statement? Is someone recording? What? Krishna. That's the latest realization. Oh, it's Krishna. My latest realization of Krishna. Well. <laughs> <sighs> as we were chanting, I just realized that Krishna is everywhere here. Actually, as I was chanting, it reminded me of when I was a brahmachari. And, uh, of course, I couldn't really make a living as a brahmachari, so I had to... <laughs> I remember <laughs> I remember when I joined the movement we used to go out for hours and hours now we didn't really have book distribution then and so we would go out for like 10 hours a day doing Hari Nam and uh, somehow as we were chanting just now I was just remembering those like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours of uh, just meditating on Krishna's name so it was uh, just going down the streets in Berkeley and then uh, we couldn't make a lot of money in Berkeley because it's just a college town so at a certain point we would go to San Francisco every day and do Sankirtan there because we do Sankirtan with uh, Jayananda and Madhudvisa and they had an amazing group there So, but that's how I started in Krishna consciousness, just uh, literally like, you know, eight, ten hours a day, six days a week, just chanting Hare Krishna and selling people fine incense. God, it was like torture. Because I, I mean, I had absolutely like zero inclination to go out in the street and sell things to people. And uh, we had this temple commander, Sanctuary leader, Chitsukananda. And he was like really charming. And he would just tell me, this is how you do it. And he would just literally <laughs> go dancing up. I remember a couple, we were on Telegraph Avenue in Berkeley, and this, this young couple just came by, walking by the street, and he literally danced up to them and just like <laughs> put the incense under their nose like that. This is just like that. And they bought it, so then he said, now you try it. So another person came, and I tried to put the incense. He said, get out of my way. <laughs> Putting in, get that incense out of my face. But we started that way. We started just chanting all day in the street. And uh, it's interesting because they say purity is a force, but also strategy helps a lot. Like if you look at Prabhupada before he came to America, same Prabhupada, same pure devotee, and yet nothing happened. Prabhupada tried very hard to get his movement going in India, and it didn't work. So there, there's kind of like this popular mythology that if you're pure, nothing else matters. It's interesting because that idea that if you're just pure, you are the Dalai Lama, <laughs> or laminate. So it's um, <laughs> that idea that all that matters is purity. If you're pure, everything else will happen automatically. Uh, really, people that say that are ignoring the real world ignoring Prabhupada's own life. Actually, what really happens when you're pure is that Krishna gives you the right strategy. Mm -hmm. 
when you're pure, it's not that when you're pure, you can just do anything. You can just lie down on the road <laughs> with a sign on, you know, the Maha, Maha Mantra sign on you or something, and, <laughs> and the world will come and surrender. It's not like that. But Prabhupada was pure, but even though Prabhupada was a pure devotee, it still didn't work in India. But because he was a pure devotee, Krishna gave him the right intelligence to change his strategy. So there's so many urban legends among us. I mean, you know, among devotees, like so many myths and legends that, that just do not correspond to what Prabhupada actually taught. I mean, I've talked to some of the most senior leaders in ISKCON that said, no, if you're pure, nothing else matters. And what about Prabhupada's <coughs> life? Is that relevant? It reminds me that um, I'm writing another paper now. That's what I do. You know, what do old people with too much time, what do they do all day? <laughs> they write papers attacking other people. And so, um, <laughs> it's interesting because take the case of Paul. Paul the Apostle kind of got himself to be Apostle. But anyway, Paul is, is without question the most influential person in the formation of the Christian church. Uh, there are 27 books in the New Testament. There are 27 books. And 13 of them, 13 of them, which is basically half, are letters written by Paul. So how is it that Paul, because there were other apostles, there was Peter, Peter, you know, uh, Pietra, it, it means rock. So Jesus said, you are the rock upon which I'll build my church. So actually, Peter was kind of like the GBC chairman. And then you had all these other apostles, you had James, the brother of Jesus. So mm -hmm. why out of 27 books in the New Testament, 13 of them are letters from Paul, and another one is written by Paul's secretary, who was named Luke, and another book is the book of the Acts of the Apostles, the book of Acts, in which the main person is Paul. So out of 27 books in the New Testament, 15 of them are basically either written by Paul or, uh, or books in which Paul is important, or his viewpoint is important. Because he um, basically he created Jesus West. And... Um, <laughs> The Jesus movement, it wasn't even called Christianity yet. I mean, Christianity was a later term. But the Jesus movement, I mean, was just a small band of people in Jerusalem who were literally starving. Because for various historical reasons, I, I mean, I could go into the whole history, but for various reasons, they weren't making it. After Jesus was crucified, whether he went to Kashmir or Glastonbury, England, or to the right hand of God, he wasn't in Israel. And so... Anyway, when Jesus was gone, um, they just couldn't, the preaching was very bad. They were, the government was against them and no one believed in them because the word Messiah, the word Messiah actually is a political military term. I don't know if you realize that. There was an interesting book that just came out, sort of a scholarly book called Zealot. Got a lot of attention uh, a few, couple of years ago. The word Messiah is a military term. Uh, the, the word Messiah, the Hebrew word Messiah, which in Greek, because the New Testament was written in Greek, for, because Greek was the English of its time, uh, the word Messiah in Greek is Christos. So that's actually what the word Christ, and, and what that word means, Messiah, Messiah in Hebrew, Christos in Greek, is the anointed one, which in, like in Sanskrit, Abhisheka, the one who's received Abhisheka, or in Sanskrit, Abhishikta. So who was, who received, who was anointed? In ancient Jewish culture, who was anointed? Who was the who was the Messiah? It was the king. And so all these terms that were attributed to Jesus, such as uh, the Messiah, the only begotten Son of God, because we're all children of God, but we're created. But this was a this was a key point in early Christian theology. Jesus is not created. philosopher. Jesus was not created. He was. Um, begotten by God. So the idea of being the begotten son of God is from the second psalm of David. And that was a psalm that was read when a new king was put on the throne. 
So calling Jesus the only, the begotten Son of God, not created but begotten, calling him the Messiah, and uh, all these other things, they were actually political claims. Because the the, the Messiah in, in ancient Israeli culture was the... Um, it was a leader who would rise up in time of foreign oppression, specifically foreign oppression, and defeat the enemies of Israel and, and restore their freedom. And so, for example, the quintessential Messiah was David, King David. And that's why in two of the books of the, of the four Gospels, two of the four Gospels, there's actually a sort of very, um, how should I put it, unsuccessful attempt made to genealogically trace Jesus back to King David. There's, I don't, I don't even know why I'm going to this. I'll, I'll get back to the main point in a second, but I just think it's interesting. Also, um, we have, I mean, we have very clear evidence that um, if, even though Jesus himself may not have been a political figure, he was surrounded by a militia. Because this was a time when the Romans, uh, of course, occupied Israel. The Roman government was very unpopular. Before the time of Jesus, or the time Jesus was born, there was a king called Herod, who was a Jewish king. The Romans used him as a client king, so they wouldn't have to get their hands messy. You know, they just, okay, Herod, you rule your crazy people and just send the taxes in. So after Herod died, his sons were so dysfunctional, just fought with each other, whoa, <laughs> that Rome was, um, Rome had to reclassify Israel. Rather than have a client king, it, they had to put it under direct Roman direct Roman uh, rule and so uh, which was extremely unpopular with the Jews and so they sent a Roman governor to directly rule Israel and his name was Pontius Pilate so because of that um, and that all happened during the life of Jesus the Roman government was very unpopular people were looking for a military figure who would rise up and defeat the Romans and basically restore Jewish freedom uh oh I'll finish this very quick, then I'll get to the point where I get to... <laughs> I want to get to the point where I get to criticize people that disagree with me. So, anyway, it's interesting. So, um, for example, everyone knows that Jesus was betrayed by Judas. And the form of that betrayal was that uh, Judas took money from the Romans and then he revealed to the Romans where Jesus was staying in Jerusalem and which one he was. That was, that was the betrayal. But the obvious question is, why in the world would the Romans, who had spies everywhere, why would the Romans have to pay somebody to find out where Jesus lived when every day Jesus walked right into the middle of town, preached to thousands of people, and then walked back? It's not that he was like airlifted back to his ashram, or he had some kind of jet helicopter, or a stealth, I don't know, skateboard or something. I mean, the point is he just walked back to where he was living. He just walked back. And so why did the Romans have to pay someone to find out where he lived? The obvious answer is because he was surrounded by a paramilitary group and who didn't allow anyone to follow them. The, the, the obvious proof is that when the Romans actually came there after the Last Supper and approached Jesus, what happens? Peter who's the leader of the group, immediately pulls a knife out and stabs one of the Roman soldiers, cuts his ear off. In other words, the people, the apostles, the people who were closest to Jesus were armed and dangerous and ready in a second to kill people. And these are the people that surrounded him. So, uh, why did I bring up all that? But anyway, I guess, I guess in one sense, I want to show the... Uh, sort of the great instability that uh, of, of the process of, the, of historical transmission, that the process by which knowledge of Jesus came down to us uh, was not stable for the simple reason that his followers were, his direct followers were illiterate peasants. Actually, that, that's, in, that's in the Bible, in the book of Acts, that, that his, all, like his direct people around him were illiterate peasants. So incapable of writing a book about him, which of course happened later. But the interesting point is that then along comes Paul. Along comes Paul. Paul is educated, unlike the other apostles, unlike the other followers. Paul is also a Roman citizen. 
not everyone in the Roman Empire was a citizen. To be a citizen was an honor, especially if you were actually not Italian. To be a Roman citizen meant, meant you had special privileges and so on. So Paul was an educated Roman citizen, also a Jew. Now what's interesting is he writes all these letters to these communities. He's like spreading the movement all over <laughs> the Roman Empire. And, uh, and he was so influential, he basically took over the church. That's why over half the books of the New Testament, or either almost half of them, are his letters, and then two more are written either by an assistant of his or about him. Because, he, because basically he took it over. It became his church. And the reason he did that, of course, is because he was preaching to Gentiles. He was making hundreds and thousands of devotees, whereas the uh, people who just were only preaching, like were following Jesus in the sense of only preaching to Jews, uh, couldn't really make devotees. And so it basically became his church. And if you look at the way the New Testament is organized, first you get the four Gospels, which are directly the life of Jesus. Then you get the book of Acts of the Apostles. That's the fifth book. And the sixth book, the very next book, it begins the letters of Paul. And so in other words, Paul is obviously the guy. And the first book, the first book of Paul, or the first letter, is the letter to the Romans. What's interesting about the letter to the Romans is, among other things, number one, it's by far the, it's the longest letter. It's considered to be, even by, um, for example, I, I'm preparing a paper in which I'm using some of this, but if you look at the website of the United States Council of Bishops of the Roman Catholic Church, this is the website of the, of the bishops of this country. So it's the official website. And they say that, the obvious, what everyone says, that the book of Romans is Paul's main theological statement. It's in the book, the first book to the Romans that Paul lays out his philosophy and uh, explains like what we believe, what our philosophy is, and, and the significance of Jesus systematically. And it had, over basically it became the teaching of, of the church. But what's very interesting about this is, and now here's the interesting part, is that Paul never quotes Jesus. You cannot tell from reading Paul's letters how much he really knew about Jesus. Because in the book of Romans, he never quotes Jesus. And he never talks about the life of Jesus. The only thing he says about the life of Jesus is that he's crucified. And that's really all Paul's interested in. Because you are saved not the way Jesus taught you to be saved. You're not saved by loving God, you know, with all your heart, soul, and might, loving your neighbor as yourself. You're not saved, as Jesus says in another place, by treating the least of my people, you know, by how you, you know, by how you treat the least of my people and so on. But you're saved. None of that will save you, actually. What actually saves you is believing Paul's interpretation of the crucifixion. Uh, in other words, what really you should focus on is not the life of Jesus, but the death of Jesus. His death is much more important than his life. It's very interesting. Actually, I'm going to put this in the shade a little more so. So you hear you have this leader who practically created the Christian church. I mean, if you, if you Google Paulianity, like instead of Christianity, there's like unlimited articles about this. So, never quotes Jesus, never talks about the life of Jesus, and we just don't know whether he even knew about the life of Jesus, or if he even knew what Jesus taught. We actually, I mean, we just don't know. So, um... So I, I, I guess the reason I was making this point, I mean, it, you know, we could talk all day about these topics, but I think what's interesting here is that um, to what extent, to what extent are we actually, hey, Vijay, you're not going to listen? Oh, Shanghai. To what extent are we, 
to what extent are we actually presenting Prabhupada as he is? I just wrote a paper in which I had to deal with one of the most senior leaders of ISKCON saying, you know, Prabhupada said this and Prabhupada didn't want that and Prabhupada wanted the other thing. And then I just showed, just by quoting Prabhupada, that actually the truth is very different. Truth is actually very different. So, one of the things I'm trying to do now in my own... Uh, my own very non-controversial life. <laughs> One of the things I'm trying to do is um, make sure that we're really that we really understand Prabhupada. It's very interesting because, uh, like, if you study the history of religions, every every new religious movement, like I said, in the first stage where you have a charismatic leader and all the authorities in that leader himself. I'm glad. She just said she wants to join Krishna West. You see? <laughs> and that she will she will work for very little. <laughs> so because psychologically, when the leader physically leaves, there's a tendency in the case of Buddha, in the case of Jesus, in the case of Prabhupada, there's a tendency to compensate for the loss of the leader's physical presence by mythologizing the leader. By mythologizing the leader and sort of, you know, creating the leader that the new leaders think they need to keep everything going. Mm -hmm. And so we have this, in some circles, we have this ultra-conservative Prabhupada who is, who is very deeply concerned about, you know, how you dress and very deeply concerned about what kind of food you eat, you know, what, I mean, not only just vegetarian offer to Krishna, but, you know, what recipes you use and deeply concerned about, about all kinds of things. But then when you look at what Prabhupada actually said, it's very different. And that's what I showed in the paper I just put out. And there are more papers coming, actually. And, and so the real point is... Um, so so it, it's not that automatic or easy. It's not that automatic or easy to preserve a sacred tradition and to make sure there's not mission drift or to make sure you haven't really gone off a little bit. It's interesting because... When I was a kid, I mean, I grew up in L.A., so in the summer we'd go to Santa Monica every day to the beach. And, uh, you know, it's interesting because there was always kind of like a strong current. And so we'd go into the water, and I, I mean, I experience this every day. So it's just, it was just a daily thing. you go into the water, and, and you would just sort of stay in the same place, catching waves. But after about 10 minutes, you were about, you know, 50 yards away from where you left your towel. You were 50 yards down the beach. So there are historical currents. There are historical currents, and if you just um, keep doing the same thing over and over again, you will actually drift away from the original mission. So, um, hey, are you? So again, it's this, um, it's this distinction which I keep trying to make over and over again, which is right there. Rupa Goswami teaches it. Prabhupada teaches it, the Bhagavatam teaches it, and yet somehow or other, it's not a concept in ISKCON, practically. It's, it's just not a concept which is talked about, which is part of uh, leadership. And that is a distinction between details, which are changeable, and basic principles. So... Um, yeah, so the, this movement is not automatically going to be successful. It's not automatically... I mean, it will in a sense, but not necessarily in your lifetime and not necessarily in this century. If we look at when, 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 when Lord Chaitanya came down, he brought... I mean, Prabhupada is, 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 a, is a liberated pure devotee. And Lord Chaitanya actually brought an army of pure devotees with him. I mean, Lord Chaitanya brought hundreds, if not thousands, of liberated pure devotees. And they preached, and they built a powerful movement. And yet, after after a time, when those generations of pure devotees were gone, uh, the movement collapsed. The movement collapsed, you know, for more than a century, maybe two centuries. 
until the great devotees came back again. You know, Bhakti No Thakur, Bhakti Santa, Prabhupada, Gorky Shore. So the quest, so it, it's not like, I mean, to say that history cannot repeat itself would be naive and just, uh, I mean, on what basis would you say that? On what basis could you assure us that history will not repeat itself? That the, the movement, at least in the Western world, cannot vanish again for centuries. I mean, when I say vanish, there, you know, there was someone, it's like, for example, in Jaipur, when uh, Arangze, but uh, I guess the, the latter part of the 1600s, he attacked Rindavan, this crazy, evil Mughal ruler, you know, destroying temples, attacking the devotees, and so they fled to Jaipur. And so there were devotees, like, for example, in the 1700s. Even the late 1700s, you have Baladev Vidyabhushan in Jaipur there. And there, so, there, you know, there were devotees. But in terms of a powerful movement, that was gone. So the reason I am doing what I'm doing is because anyone that's trained, seriously trained as a historian knows uh, that, you know, there's trouble. There, there are real historical dangers. And as far as I can see, the most important question is never asked. It's not the, 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 the ultimate question is not how do you do a nice program to reach these people or how do you do a nice program to reach those people, whether they're yoga teachers or whether they're you know, this group or that group or this subculture or that subculture. I mean, that's all nice. That's all good. But it seems to me that there's a prior and more fundamental question, which is, according to history, according to social science, how do you build a successful world religion? Because all of our little niche programs, this niche, that niche, and the other niche, ultimately will not save the movement. If there's not a movement that people actually want to join. We can build hundreds of bridge programs, but if people don't want to go to the other side of the bridge, it won't help. If people like one side of the bridge, but they're not comfortable on the other side of the bridge, they don't cross the bridge. Bridge, they'll just camp out at the foot of the bridge, but they won't cross it. And that's what we're actually seeing. Just like in a temple not far from here, a bhakti center for Western people closed down. So, so, so we're actually seeing that. People will come to the foot of a bridge, but that doesn't mean they're going to cross it. You know, people are not that stupid. They actually look to see what's on the other side of the bridge. And the reason people cross bridges is because they want to get to the other side. It's like, why did the chicken cross the road to get to the other side? Why did, you know, why did the chicken cross the bridge to get to the other side. So that's the point. Unless we have, unless both sides of the bridge are attractive, people won't cross it. And that's actually what we're seeing. So uh, we need to ask these basic questions and look at history and look at social science. And, and anyway, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to, uh, like those cartoons you see with some guy in a robe carrying aside, the world's going to end, repent. <laughs> you know, I have my apocalyptic vision. But, th but that's basically what I'm trying to do. But if you look at a corporation that's not doing well, if you look at a corporation that's not doing well, one of the, one of the inevitable symptoms are, let's say there's some big problem with the corporation that's not doing well. The problem is not the problem. The problem is that someone's talking about the problem. From the point of view of the people in the corporation, the problem is that someone's talking about it. Because if you don't talk about the problem, it doesn't exist. Yes? Can we take question now? Mahesh? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, Dale. <laughs> One time, I just to give a little background on this. Kamal Krishna Maharaj was giving a lecture in Mayapur, and he was uh, mentioning some kind of success. You know, we have still so many books, we 
had so many temples and you know a few other things and uh, in his view he was presenting was successful but as I was listening my question to you is that well I was thinking you know we have if it's number of people, if it's a number of people to be successful, the Mormons have many thousands. And they're more the successful Jehovah than we witnesses, are. The witnesses, yeah. they have, when I, whenever I used to be at the airport, I will ask them, how many people are preachers going? They said 60,000. So I'm thinking, okay, so now my question to you, what will be considered to be actually a success that a, a religious organization is like successful? Will be the number of people Will be the purity. Will be just the social. Uh... Well, it's both. It's all of it. Uh -huh. Prabhupada, Prabhupada cared about the numbers. You know, we, we can't just be like that's kind of like the losers' philosophy. Who cares about numbers? Numbers don't. Yeah, they do matter. In fact, in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, Prabhupada gave his numbers, his statistics. You know, RBIs, home runs, slugging average. Anyway, Chase Pulver, <laughs> Prabhupada. Prabhupada gave the numbers in, in, in the purport to say that fools don't know how to recognize who is actually the empowered servant of Krishna. So yes, the numbers matter. Sustainable numbers. So why... Yeah, the numbers matter. And I, to be very honest, if we're allowed to speak the truth, I guess I am because it's a public park. <laughs> it's a drone. It's a drone. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, watched by the Isconic State. So, <laughs> the point is that um, I think there are other groups that actually care more about people than we do. Yes. J just looking at it from outside, I, I think what happens is in history, history moves dialectically. It goes, you know, from one extreme to the other extreme, and then finally, maybe someday, you get back to the middle. So what you find in this con kind of history is in the early days of the movement, sort of like this artificial level of self-abnegation, self-denial, self-sacrifice at an artificial level, and then people reacted against that, and now ISKCON is just, it's just a movement where basically everyone, before anything else, thinks about themselves. And um, if you look at the Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, whose philosophy is, um, <laughs> I guess it goes to show that you don't need a good philosophy to, to grow, but, but if you look at that, or even the Mormons, um, just looking as an observer, it, it seems they're much more serious. They actually care a lot more about other people. And there's another point also. I think one of the reasons is not because devotees aren't good people or you know don't care or whatever, but I think one of the problems is that uh, although it's not talked about and people probably may not even be aware of it, but I think basically the Hare Krishna movement in the Western world is demoralized. I think most devotees in the West have basically given up. You know, we don't talk about it, people may not even think about it, because it's obvious that whatever we're doing, it doesn't work. And, you know, no matter how sincere you are, no matter how nicely you chant your japa, there's only so many years you keep going on telling yourself something which your eyes are telling you is not really true. You know, people can't just go on believing forever when they see that it's it just it doesn't really happen. Yes. You know, I don't think there's a difference between being successful as a Speak preaching up. mission and expanding, and any individual devotee's success in developing some attachment for Shri Prabhupada and Krishna. So. True. So someone can go on for 20 years and they may be discouraged that as a preaching mission we're not being successful on that level, but they may still feel enlivened personally that somehow or other they have received Krishna's grace and they're encouraged. That's, yeah, I agree, but that's half of Krishna consciousness. But at least I'm just saying, because the statement seemed like you weren't... 
No, of course. Of, no, yeah, no, no, of course. There are many sincere devotees in the movement. Many. There are many very sincere devotees who are attached to Krishna. However, Prabhupada, what we see in Prabhupada's life is that he was relentless. He kept trying new things until he found something that worked. I mean, look at Prabhupada's life. Prabhupada went to Jansi. Well, first, actually, as a householder, his plan was he would just make a lot of money and finance the preaching. And Krishna sabotaged that. He went bankrupt. Then Prabhupada went to Jansi. And he saw that wasn't really working. So then he, he changed his plan. He went back to Delhi. And he started printing these little sheets, Back to Godhead, and, uh, and giving them out. And then he just saw, this is not really going to do it. And so then, based on someone's suggestion, he went to Vrindavan. He said, I'll write the Bhagavatams. And then he did the Bhagavatams. And when he, the Bhagavatams came out, he, he, it's not that he got the Bhagavatams just the next day he was on the boat. When the Bhagavatams came out, he was going around giving out his books, preaching. We know that he, you know, the Prime Minister of India, he got his picture taken with the Prime Minister of India, giving him some Bhagavatams. But he just saw this isn't it's still not working. So then he came to America. And when he came to America, he went to Butler. And in Butler, uh, if you look at the history of Prabhupada, in the beginning, we have no clear indication that Prabhupada planned to leave there. He just went to Butler and he started preaching. It's not like he went to Butler and he, and he said immediately, okay, I'm not really going to stay here. That was the plan, to preach from Butler. And then after a while, it, he realized, oh my God, this is Butler, Pennsylvania. <laughs> you know, he, he realized what that meant in the context of America. But he was always thinking of going to New York, so it appeared like he was actually going to... But he could have gone to New York at any time. At a certain point, he actually went. At a certain point, he actually went. I mean, he definitely, at a certain point, he was preaching in Butler. That's what he was doing. He was living there and he was preaching. And it was, I think, for, you know, for months. Not that he just stopped there, you know, kind of had a few good meals and went off to New York. And then when he got to New York, you know, he got a loft and he tried that and, and, and that didn't work. And then he, he went to, he started uh, going to the Dr. Mishra programs. And again, if you read the biography, Prabhupada was say, okay, that, he was trying that. That was the plan. Let's see if I can work with Dr. Mishra. And then that didn't work. And then, so if you look at Prabhupada, he's constantly innovating. When, when do you see in the life of Prabhupada, especially once he really starts to manifest himself as a sannyasi, when do you see in the life of Prabhupada that something's not working, so he just keeps doing it for 30 more years? <laughs> Can anyone give me an example of that from Prabhupada's life? I mean, I can give you an example of that, you know, from the life of Iskon. But can you give me an example where Prabhupada's doing something, it's just not working, and he just keeps doing it for 30 years? I don't see that in Prabhupada's life. You said that, you know, Prabhupada was alone and he could understand what was going on in that direction. So it's much easier to move along. Than that what? He was alone. So he could make those decisions and move everything he wanted, whatever, because he was not dependent. Now we have to convince 30 people that we are not doing right. And for some people, being right means selling 20 books. For another people, just that somebody is attached to riches. So it's not the same one vision, like Prabhupada had the, the flexibility and the openness to make a decision because he was guided by Krishna. But now we have this 30 devotees. No, but, 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 but I, 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 I think that is a serious misunderstanding of what Prabhupada actually set up. I think that's, a, I mean, and, and it's good you brought that up. Because if you read Prabhupada's will, what Prabhupada's own language in his last will and testament, the first point, the GVC, Governing Body Commission, shall be the ultimate managing authority for ISKCON. Managers. Managers. Not God on earth, not dictators, <laughs> managers. Managers. And if you actually go and read what Prabhupada says about his intention for the GBC, it's number one that they not interfere with local preaching, that they, you know, allow people to the freedom within Prabhupada's program to develop their programs. So do I need to be approved? within Prabhupada's guidelines to go out and do a program? No, I don't. 
Prabhupada makes it very clear over and over and over again that the duty of the GBC is simply to make sure it's a, it's a ISKCON program. It's like, you know, are we preaching the right philosophy? Is, is it Prabhupada's teachings? Are we, is it the same spiritual program? Chanting Hare Krishna, not chanting some new mantra. That's all. Is it bona fide? In the simple sense of the word. If it is, don't bother people. Obviously, if there's disputes, if, if, if it's like this, people are fighting or something, yes, yeah, someone has to make peace. But if we really go back and see what was Prabhupada's intention, how Prabhupada defines these things, Prabhupada, Prabhupada wanted to set up a society of Brahmins, not Shudras. A community where the leader says, you don't have to think, I'll do the thinking, I'll make all the decisions, I don't want anyone speaking out unless they agree with me. That's called a Shudra community. That's a Shudra community. That's not a Brahmin community. So it's very interesting that some people that consider themselves very conservative and, you know, protecting what Prabhupada really wanted, as if Prabhupada was also an ultra-conservative like them, as if. And I showed in my paper the real Prabhupada by quoting Prabhupada dozens of times what Prabhupada actually said. And yet, what could be a greater deviation? What could be a great, greater violence to Prabhupada's mission than to treat Brahmins like Shudras? And to shut them up and tell them not to think. So, if no one speaks out, it's interesting because in, I remember one time Prabhupada wrote a letter to us. It was 19, well, I can't remember, maybe 75 or something, around then. And there was a big problem in the New York Temple because the leader there, he was a real tyrant. He was like, you know, sort of a bully, telling everyone what to do. And then it turned out he himself was fallen. And so some devotees organized basically to throw him out. And then other devotees didn't want to criticize, didn't want to be involved. And there, so there was like this dispute, like because some devotees took action, some didn't. And then Prabhupada wrote a very interesting letter. He said both positions were understandable and acceptable for Vaishnav. There are Vaishnavas who don't want to get involved in those things, don't want to criticize. Yeah. yeah. And also correcting. Yeah. But the people who, who told the truth and spoke out and helped to correct things, Prabhupada also praised them. So it's not, it's, it's not a question that everyone has to be forced into becoming an activist. But at the same time, in fact, if you look at Prabhupada's own statements, Prabhupada writes a letter saying, if people criticize the GBC, what is Prabhupada's conclusion? That the GBC is not behaving properly. In other words, there's actually a letter from Prabhupada where he points out that it's their duty to act in such a way that people are not unhappy and don't all criticize them. So Prabhupada did not want, did not, Prabhupada did not come to America and start ISKCON to form a Shudra society where a few leaders do all the thinking and no one else is allowed to think or voice their view. I mean, obviously it has to be done within Prabhupada's boundaries. And if no one does it, I mean, how can we, how can we, obviously power corrupts obviously power corrupts whether it's inside or outside the Hare Krishna movement because we're human beings we're conditioned souls it's like when you joined the movement did you suddenly you know the, the day you moved into a Hare Krishna temple become completely detached from eating you had no attraction to the opposite sex you had nothing like it didn't you didn't care at all whether people respected you or not I mean obviously not we are conditioned souls we are working toward purification so the basic impurity the basic impurity of a conditioned soul is wanting to lord it over other people and if I get a big position in the Hare Krishna movement am I really a Paramahansa pure devotee that I have no propensity to lord it over other people I in no way exploit my position just to you know push other people around 
And that's why what ISKCON actually needs is a constitutional government. That is Vedic culture. Vedic culture was not absolute monarchy. In Vedic culture, the king didn't do whatever he wanted. It was a constitutional monarchy that's very clear in the Shastra. The king had to act according to Dharma. The word Dharma in Sanskrit also means law. That's the main Sanskrit word for law, Dharma. And so to say that the king had to be Dharma Raja meant he had to follow the law. And this was actually a key point if you look at European history. Because you had, if you look at er earlier European history, I mean, think of the Magna Carta, where, where the king was in Latin primus entry pares, the first among equals, where you had all these nobles in a country, whether it was England or France or whatever, and then the, the most powerful noble became the king, but there were other nobles that, had, that ruled their own land. And then at a certain point, for various historical reasons of, say, in the 1600s, you had this rise of absolute monarchy, people like Louis XIV. You know, where, where some ambassadors came to see built Versailles. And so some ambassadors came and they asked him, what's the form of government in your country? And they said, the, the state. You know, how, how, you know, what kind of state do you have? L'État in France. And in famous, he said, L'État? C'est moi. The state? It's me. And so you have this absolute monarchy, which, of course, produced the French Revolution. And a restoration for some time of constitutional monarchy. In fact, Napoleon, even though Napoleon was kind of a uh, little too theatrical, crowning himself and everything, but, but actually Napoleon, despite all of his eccentric behavior, was actually spreading the ideals of the French Revolution in some ways because one of the main principles was constitutional government. There has to be a set of objective rules and laws that apply to everybody. You may be a king, you may be a president, a prime minister, you may, you know, you may be a taxi driver, but there is the law. In fact, that's one of the main principles of modern civilized society. The rule of law, not the rule of the whims of individuals. You know, whatever whim an individual has, that, that, you know, that's the law. No. The rule of law. Objective, fair law. So if you're a devotee in ISKCON, you know, whoever you are, you have a right to justice. People can't just, you know, do things to you. They have to show good reason. They have to give you a chance to defend yourself. The rule of law. Justice. It's the nature of a civilized society. And actually, we don't have it yet. This is not a criticism because this comes a new movement. But we have not yet reached the point of having a fully civilized society. And you have people, you know, they may be a committee, it may be a, you know, a governing commission, a committee. But it still has the power to do whatever it wants without giving proper explanations without giving accused people a right to defend themselves, without themselves following any objective principles of justice. They can simply do what they want. And that, in my view, is an imitation of Prabhupada. Because when Prabhupada was here, uh, he just did what he wanted. But he's a pure devotee. You know, we're not. We know who we are. So... I see that ISKCON has to move forward, and, and this will actually strengthen the GBC, because as, as I was pointing out, just like every action Newton says produces an equal and opposite reaction, think of a pendulum. You know, the more you pull the pendulum to this side, the more it goes to the other side. So tyranny, ultimately, is not a sustainable form of government. Because when you have tyranny, it produces its opposite, which is anarchy. So I, I believe that in order to get this movement going again, because I can't imagine really, I mean, anything, what could possibly be as important as getting this movement going again? I think we need, to, we, think we need two things, basically. First of all, we need to restore a complete and full understanding of who Prabhupada was and what he actually taught. No, Prabhupada was not an ultra-conservative. 
No, Prabhupada was not really anxious that everyone, you know, adopt Indian culture. Even, for example, I'm finishing another paper right now in which I'm going over these things very, in a, you could say, a scholarly way. For example, 1967, I guess starting around September 67 till around maybe April 68, uh, March or April 68, you had this famous incident with Kirtananda. You know, basically, where Kirtananda uh, went with Prabhupada to India, when Prabhupada first went back to India, and he pushed Prabhupada to give him sannyas, so Prabhupada gave him sannyas. And then right after he took sannyas, Prabhupada told him now, go to London and open a center there. And Prabhupada personally gave him money. Prabhupada personally gave him money and a letter of introduction to a, an English lady who was going to help us. Kirtananda disobeyed Prabhupada took money from other devotees without Prabhupada's permission, changed his ticket, and flew straight from India back to New York. Prabhupada was shocked. If you, you see, what I've done is I actually went back and read all the letters. And so if you read all of Prabhupada's letters in that time, because he, he talks about it almost every day, if you look at the letters. And Prabhupada keeps saying over and over again, I'm shocked, I'm so shocked. He keeps using that word. First of all, what really disturbed him was that Kirtananda... Uh, had disobeyed him. Prabhupada was astonished because, and, and then Prabhupada starts saying, he pushed me to take sannyas because he thought he was as good as me or he doesn't need a guru anymore. And so Prabhupada saw that he had become proud by taking sannyas and no longer felt himself to be subordinate to Prabhupada. That's what really disturbed Prabhupada. It wasn't because Kirtananda was dressed like this or that. That was the issue. And that's what Prabhupada talks about over and over and over again. And then the next thing that happens is Kirtananda starts to grow a beard. It's interesting what Prabhupada says about that. He says, in certain cases, we can use beards. Prabhupada does not reject the idea of using beards. He says, rarely, that's the word he uses, that in certain, you know, special circumstances, yeah, right, <laughs> that, that in certain circumstances we can use beards. However, Prabhupada says, and this is his real concern, and he says it again and again and again, I do not want people to think we are hippies. You have to remember ISKCON or, or the Hare Krishna movement, 26 Second Avenue, that was plan B. Plan A, which you can clearly see in the Lilamrita over and over and over again, is that Prabhupada wanted to reach respectable, important people in society, leaders of society, and establish a respectable adult movement. And that completely failed. No one responded. And plan B was the hippies. And so Prabhupada says over and over again that you shouldn't use a beard, you have to be clean-shaven, not because it's Vedic, not because it's Vaishnava, but because I don't want people thinking we're hippies. We have to distinguish ourselves from the hippies. And then if you follow, if you read Prabhupada's letters, then Kirtananda's deviation begins to pick up steam. And then he starts to do two things. Number one, is this my water? Or? It is? He, he, he rejects Indian clothes and starts using Western clothes, although somewhat eccentric Indian, uh, American clothes. Not dressed like a gentleman, just kind of like Zorro or something, without the mask. And, um, and, and then he starts preaching Mayavad philosophy. He actually starts preaching impersonalism. And so it's very interesting how Prabhupada responds to these two new... Prabhupada says, for example in the temple wear robes. But then every time Prabhupada says wear robes, immediately afterward he says, but actually, if you want to wear a Western dress, I have no objection. So on the, <coughs> on the issue of Kirtananda wearing, you know, saying, no, we need to wear a Western dress to attract Western people. First of all, that was not, this is 1967 and 68, in the middle of the hippie movement, in the middle of the counterculture when everyone loved Indian things and the movement was growing like crazy. Unlike now. Totally different from now. But even then, every time Prabhupada says you should wear robes, he always says right after that, but I don't, it's really okay if you want to wear Western clothes. That's not what Prabhupada's really concerned about. What he's really concerned about is that Kirtananda is preaching Mayavad philosophy. He's preaching impersonalism. For example, 
You know what he's preaching because Prabhupada is refuting his arguments in his letters. He's preaching that uh, we shouldn't chant names of God because God's not personal. It's just the universal self and therefore we should just like make vibrations, like some kind of mystic vibrations. And so he actually is preaching not to chant the Maha Mantra because those are personal names of God and ultimately God doesn't have a personal identity. And so that's, that's, that was what was going on. That's what was going on. But it's interesting because the way it's filtered down to conservatives in ISKCON is, oh, Kirtananda took sannyas and then he put on Western clothes and that was the whole problem. That was the least of it. That was almost the trivial part of it. The issue was he disobeyed Prabhupada directly and, and Prabhupada says over and over and over again, he thinks he's better than me. He thinks he's now the guru, not me. And Prabhupada says this repeatedly. He disobeys Prabhupada, he thinks he's now the guru, and he's preaching impersonalism. And that's what the problem was. But it's interesting because, you know, one of the, one of the <clears throat> unfortunate consequences of the fact that years ago we preached to everyone to drop out of college and join the movement is that there's this very heavy amateurism in ISKCON. In the sense that you don't have to check your facts. You don't have to really do any scholarship. You don't really have to know what you're talking about. If you're a, a high manager, if you're a high manager, then you know everything. What's that? Sorry. Okay. Because it's interesting because Krishna gives the highest knowledge in Bhagavad Gita. So if you know the Bhagavad Gita, you know everything, and therefore you are qualified to give authoritative opinions on any subject, even subjects in which you are entirely ignorant. But actually, so, so we just we just don't have that habit of being scholarly, of actually checking things. And the Iso Upanishad says, Vidyang cha vidyang cha jastad bedo bhayang saha. To be liberated, you have to know both. You have to know this world and the spiritual world. And so, there's a lot at stake here. Is this con going to become simply sort of a, 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 an un, uneducated, fundamentalist religion? Or is it actually going to present a spiritual science? Are we actually going to present a spiritual science? Are we going to successfully establish Prabhupada's mission all over the world like he wanted? <clears throat> or is the movement just going to collapse everywhere outside India and maybe Russia? Or the Ukraine? Yes. I have a question um, about precedent for a sustained, spiritually alive, spiritual movement. Is there one? <laughs> is there a pre- she said, is there a good question? Is there a precedent for a sustained, spiritually alive movement? Uh, yeah, I mean, after Lord Chaitanya came, it went on for quite some time. Well, we can learn from history. We can learn from, I mean, it's like a garden. It's not that you, okay, we weeded the garden once and for all. There's no once and for all weeding. You have to constantly go back to your garden. So I think, I mean, periodically, ISKCON has to, uh, you know, clean itself up. But in this movement, I don't think we've really developed a tradition, a tradition of self-criticism. Because you have this somewhat unholy merger of managers also having like high spiritual positions. And therefore, you have this extremely dangerous culture in which it's offensive to criticize management. It's happened in the real world, too. Yeah. I mean, it's happened in corporations all the time. And the ones that fail. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah, the, and, 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 and so um, it's, it's a very dangerous combination where you, where you sacralize management. So if you criticize management, you're committing Vaishnava Parad. It just feels very macho. 
Yeah. Yeah. Extremely dangerous. It can only lead to bad management. It can only lead to bad administration. There's no other possible outcome when you make management sacred and in any way to criticize management is to commit offenses against Vaishnavas. It's game over. I mean, you're, you're going to basically have it, be, you know, develop a dysfunctional society. Well, that happens all the time. I mean, it happened even with your disciples. I mean, how many of your disciples would want to come and say, I disagree with you? In the sense that it happens naturally. You respect somebody, you don't want to disagree, you don't want to be in the wrong place. You don't in in my own life, I don't, I don't pressure anyone to no, work I'm with. Yeah, I, as a principle that. Uh, yeah, I know that, but I, I know in my own life, for decades, you know, I, you know, what I did 20, 30 years ago, God only knows. But I can say that for decades, I don't pressure people to work with me. I don't, I don't try to force myself on anyone, disciples or not, and tell them how to live their lives. If someone wants my advice, I'll give it. If someone wants to help me, I appreciate it. But I'm talking about the fact that they, they have the freedom to speak up and say something they are not in agreement with. Well, they just people... They don't, they, they, they're not natural. And some people like me, I'm always disagreeing, always raising my hand, always asking questions. You know me, but I do that in every word. Well, I, but, I've con but, I've consciously, but I've consciously not put myself in a position of management. It's just like we, because, because actually it's not Vedic. I mean, you know, Prabhupada, he had to do everything. So he had to manage everything, and he, which he always complained about. He didn't want to do it. But if you look at the Vedic system, there's Brahmins and Kshatriyas. And so that's why I made a conscious decision not to be a big manager. Because I, I, I think it's not a healthy combination. But you have to manage from the background. You still have to manage. Uh, not really. If you start studying something new... No, not really. Patients. Not really. If you look at Krishna West, for example, where there's devotees who are into it all over the world. I mean, it's amazing how, much, how many people are into it. And when I went to Europe, people kept asking me, what do we do practically in, in this center? And I, I kept saying... You have to figure it out. If I was in Norway, you're Norwegians, you have to figure out Norway. You're Germans, you're Italians, you're French. Everywhere I went, I told people, you should come up with a practical plan based on your knowledge of your country. <laughs> but it's possible, I mean, it is possible that in terms of philosophy, yes. and even, even applied philosophy, mm -hmm. that someone actually gets it right. And it, it's not that a disciple of mine has a duty to disagree <clears throat> with me just, just for the sake of disagreeing. I mean, if they have a better idea, believe me. You know, believe me, I would be eternally grateful to someone that had a better idea than Krishna West. Eternally grateful. Because it, Krishna West is actually a serious threat to my lazy intelligence. <laughs> and so... I'm working too hard. So, <laughs> so the point is, if someone has a better idea, or if someone can take Krishna West and say, oh, I'll manage it, be my guest. I'm not attached to telling other people what to do. I already had my thrills when I was young. Believe me, at this point in my life, I have no desire to tell anyone else what to do. I'm, sim I'm simply thinking of Prabhupada. your perspective, but when somebody is in a figure of an authority and a spiritual leader, the general public will submit themselves down and they will not speak up in the fact even they see something wrong. But also now because about what he was saying about that there's a culture that it's not all right to do that. So. Well, frankly, I get advice all the time from disciples that work with me. I have, you know, I have developed relationships with many disciples and they're intelligent and they're committed. And I get advice all the time like, you shouldn't have done that, or you shouldn't have said that, or next time you should do it this way. On that practical level, I get advice constantly from people around me. No, I know, and I, and I think I'm a big one of them. <laughs> what I'm talking about is a, a, how do you change the culture? Because you're talking about the leaders, okay? And how the leaders are doing something wrong or they should change or whatever. But I'm talking about the people who are not leaders who also have a tendency. I'm not talking about you and your disciples and the people who yeah. relate to you, but in general. All I I'm can do is, general. yeah, all I can do 
is try to speak the truth as I see it. And yes, not everyone's going to stand up, but some people will respond. <clears throat> and, and ultimately, what else can I do except try to speak the truth? I don't think that Srila Prabhupada is as conservative as people present him as, but I also think that just like myself, I have individual relationships and so people perceive me differently depending on my relationship. Srila Prabhupada's disciples also perceived him differently depending on their relationship with him and how he dealt with them individually according to their mentality and then what to speak of the second generation devotees who didn't have the same experience of Srila Prabhupada but still developed relationship through their own realization and, and service and reading. And so, I mean, within the society, one of the biggest problems I see, I think it's, it's really important for you to speak out about how you understand Srila Prabhupada. But I think, I wish that there was more tolerance in general on everywhere to recognize that someone may be taking the position they're having based on their realization and relationship also so that there's some more kind of willingness to allow that Prabhupada build a house for everyone and true depending on their angle of vision true. there's a space for them. You know? True. True. I appreciate your point. I'll, I'll just add this. Okay. That um, <clears throat> unfortunately, unfortunately, I am the last member of ISKCON trained by Prabhupada, active, active, you know, active preaching, leading. The last one in ISKCON who was trained by Prabhupada as a Western GBC. And so, um, of course, ultimately, you know, we're not going to go and spray paint people's dhotis or tear their dhotis off, you know, acts of Krishna West vandalism, you know, rip people's dhotis off in public on Harinam or something, you know, like sort of PETA. So, PETA. So, but um, what I'm doing is I'm not, the, the points that I make, the papers I write or the talks I give, I'm not saying because I'm a guru, because I'm a sannyasi, because blah 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 I'm trying to persuade people I'm not I'm not arguing on the basis that because I have this position therefore you have to accept what I say I'm trying to persuade people and uh, if I feel as I do that certain modes of presentation public presentation are seriously damaging our image in our ability to um, grow this movement, I feel it's my duty to say it. Yeah, and of course, some of these things are very much sacred cows. Yes, Sachi. Oh, I'm sorry. Are both of you at the same time? Yes. So, Maharaj, in the early 70s, he was speaking about the creation of Uttarananda uh, Maharaj. Some, someone else came to mind almost being like the first Krishna West and uh, Siddha Swarup. Oh, good you mentioned that because I'm also dealing with him in my paper. Yeah, so I was thinking that the main, one of the main issues was he couldn't get along with his stepbrothers. He had a different view, a way to deal, his view to spread Krishna consciousness. And I was picturing this totally Krishna West. So yeah. Please, uh, can yeah, you I'll explain me? about that. How many of you have heard of Siddha Sarupananda? Oh, he'll be pleased to know that. <laughs> anyway, he, well, he was a young guy from Hawaii named Chris Butler, a charismatic teacher, a spiritual teacher. And then he became Sai, S-A-I, took on the name Sai. Anyway, he, he became a follower of Prabhupada. He understood Prabhupada's greatness. And he was already a guru. He's a young guy. He was our age his early 20s I'm still very young where's the race do not contradict so um, he actually joined ISKCON and he he brought all his disciples must have I don't know what 100 or 70 or I don't know what the number was 
And they all joined ISKCON, and, and they became initiated by Prabhupada. He became initiated by Prabhupada as Siddha Sarupananda. I think Prabhupada also gave him sannyas. And um, his followers who joined, many of them are very well-known ISKCON <laughs> devotees. I mean, they, yeah. they, they went all over America mostly, I guess, maybe some other places, and they, they did a lot of valuable service. So that was in 1970, I think, when he came. Now, the problem was, there were two problems. Number one, I mean, obviously he had his own ideas. He very much favored, well, I can't say Krishna West, that would be anachronistic, because he thought of it long before I did. But he very much favored that Western-style preaching. And that's what he did, not all the Indian stuff. But also, I mean, obviously he was used to having his own thing. And, and also, unfortunately, the GBCs he worked under <coughs> in Hawaii were really burnt him out. And it's not, I mean, it's not just his fault because he worked under some really bad GBC representatives. Threatened him, and they were just like, you know, and, and he just, you know, he, he wasn't going to be bullied. And so, if you look at all of Prabhupada's letters, as I've recently just gone over it, even before Prabhupada passed away, there was already some tension, and he was already seriously thinking like he had to separate himself again. He couldn't, in fact, there's a famous conversation where he, he comes into Prabhupada's room and says, I, I can't be in ISKCON. So, so, you know, for a while, for a couple of years it worked out, but then after a while he was thinking, I can't do this, I can't be in ISKCON, because he really couldn't stand the GBCs. Because, and the GBC, again, in fairness to him, the GBCs he worked with were, uh, they were kind of intolerable. They were really trying to push him around and bully him. And, and So Prabhupada, so it was an issue. There's that famous exchange where he said, I accept you, Prabhupada, but not ISKCON. And Prabhupada said, that's not possible because I'm a member of ISKCON. And then he said, okay, well, I accept ISKCON, but not the GBC. And then Prabhupada was saying, but that's our system. But then, so to make a long story short, when Prabhupada passed away and Siddhasarup wasn't named one of the Fab 11, as I call them, you know, the new gurus, um, he just, uh, it was, he, you know, he broke with ISKCON and, but also because I think one of the leaders, uh, GBC, is not in ISKCON now, or uh, he was, uh, yeah, I think he threatened Siddhu. And so they also developed back then, they started developing this, like this culture of, I don't know, you call it paranoia, because you could say it's rational. But for example, I remember, I think in 1978, maybe, when we were at the Vrindavan Mayapur festival, and the guru system was starting, or maybe, I can't remember whether it was 77, when Prabhupada was still there, but it was one of those years. And um, I went, you know, we were all in the Brindavan guest house. There, were no, there was nowhere else to stay back then. It was just, you could either stay in the Brindavan guest house or in the Brindavan guest house. So, so I, you know, I had my room and I just, I just, you know, went down the hall a few rooms where his room was. I thought, oh, goes, because, you know, I, I got along with him all right. Because, you know, I was friendly and I wasn't trying to lord it over him. And so, you know, he had no problem with me. So I went down, but it was interesting to get into his room. And this is just one of the rooms in the Vrindavan guest house, just, you know, these rooms with a door. But I had to go through like two or three layers of security. Like you'd knock on the, first of all, there was someone outside the door like, what do you want, Maharaj? And then I, oh, I just come and say hello to, you know, so, so, so he said, all right, wait a second. So then he goes and talks to the next guard. And I was passed to the next level. And then they had curtains like in the, by the door. There were curtains like you had to be. You had to go through these different... And this is just like a little guest room in Vrindavan. Finally, I got into his room. And then we just talked, you know. And, but he was... Uh, but it's interesting because then he did leave ISKCON. And I think because of the way he'd been treated by certain bad GBCs. And also because I think the most obvious thing was that the people he preached to would be attracted to ISKCON, because like if you're attracted to Siddhartha Sarup's little program, <clears throat> there's this huge international Hare Krishna, but so therefore, I think, in a, you know, for his own, what he thought were pragmatic reasons, they began to really demonize ISKCON, and, and, and it really became this culture of seeing ISKCON as this movement which was dangerous. First of all, dangerous because people in ISKCON were capable of committing acts of violence, maybe murder, against Siddhartha Sarup himself or his followers. Secondly, ISKCON was dangerous because ISKCON had such a terrible reputation in the public and the only way that 
they could ever succeed as if no one in the world thought they were the Hare Krishna movement. And so it's interesting, if you go to their website, they now call themselves Science of Identity Foundation. I'm thinking of changing my own name. I'm thinking of calling myself L. Ron Acharya <laughs> and getting a yacht. But anyway. So. The name is what got you in trouble in the first place, Maharaj. <laughs> L. Ron Acharya, like that. So he. Um, <laughs> but it's interesting because if you go to their website, uh, they, don't, they never say the word Krishna. They never say the word Krishna. And I, I watched a few of their little video clips, which are not bad. They say, like, um, you can chant Hari Bol or Nitai Gore, but they don't chant Hari Krishna. Because they're just so... And, and secretive. It's like no one knows where Siddhasrupa is, where he lives. No one has access. It just became like this real... I mean, there's a little touch of paranoia in it, all of it. But, but they've done well. I mean, they, they made a lot more devotees than Iskhan Hawaii. A lot more. Because they use this Western approach, and they're actually much more successful. They have a chain of natural food stores, so they're actually much more successful <laughs> in Western preaching than Iskhan Hawaii. Tulsi what? Tulsi Gabbard. Uh, <coughs> yeah, the congresswoman. Yeah, she was she was one of the disciples. Although she's <laughs> been a you know diplomatic politician, he took them all my back. keeps peace with all the devotee groups. She's like you know open and rational, but but what I mean to say is. Um, so here, here's the conclusion. Oh, but also, I, I guess also, Iskan, Iskan, I'm writing a pa- I'm writing this in a paper. That's why it's in my mind. Uh, I think he saw that Iskan threatened them in three ways. Number one, it was actually a physical threat, which I think after these sort of bad GBCs left Iskan, which they did, that was just a fiction, just a like kind of, you know, it's a typical thing where 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 a dictator tells people, you know, there's a danger out there, there's a danger out there, don't go outside. And so Iskon was kind of really, it was always like the, the, the bad, you know, the villain was always Iskon. So Iskon was a physical threat. Iskon's terrible reputation uh, was a threat to their reputation. And the third thing, interestingly, was that um, because Siddhartha Rupanam was very much like, you know, the charismatic leader, Iskon threatened his place in history. And the reason I mention this is because... Um, about, oh, I don't know how many years ago. It's 2015. Maybe 10 years ago, I can't remember. I'm too ecstatic to remember all these things, but I, we, I got this letter which was sent to all the GBC, and I was on the GBC then. And it was from Siddhas Rupananda, a letter to all of us. And on his letterhead, those are the days when people actually sent, like, mail, you know, like, paper, mail. And so on his letterhead, it said, Jagat Guru Paramahansa, Siddha Supananda, Maharaj, Swami, etc., etc. I thought this was like, I thought I, I, it was kind of amusing to me because even Prabhupada, on his letterhead, on his own letterhead, would only say A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami. So your letterhead is what you're calling yourself. It's not what other people are calling you. It's what you call yourself. So in his letterhead, even though Prabhupada, you know, insisted it was a major point, he was Prabhupada, but it wasn't on his letterhead. And he didn't sign his name that way. It was something that we had to call him, like when we published his book. But he wouldn't, and, and so on Prabhupada's letterhead, it would say A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, and then he would sign his name that way. But Sisarup, on his own letterhead, put Jagat Guru Paramahansa. So clearly he was, you know, crowned himself, and and anyway, it was this letter that went on for pages, basically attacking us, the GBCs, for our malicious lie that Prabhupada wanted certain people to be gurus. And there was, of course, there was no evidence. There was no historical evidence. There was no, there was nothing you could call in, in, in a serious sense of the word an argument. Like in terms of scholarship, in terms of historiography, there was nothing that you could call an argument. It was just sort of declaring that... Uh, and, you know, we were, we'd done this terrible thing and then we should repent and, and, and rectify this gr- grave mistake. And so it's obvious in that letter he sent us that he was deeply concerned about his place in history. And that Islam was also a threat in that sense. So a physical threat, a threat to their public image, and a threat to his place in history. And so for all these reasons, they um, sort of systematically put Iskand down. And so Iskand devotees aren't allowed to go there. They're just like, they're, you know, they're the villains in the story. 
But so I've been compared to Sis Rupananda. <laughs> he actually, but the interesting thing is they actually preach very well. If you look at their preaching, as far as it goes, they don't preach about Krishna Lelux. They don't preach about Krishna, at least not to the public, because then people might think we're the Hare Krishna movement. But um, they preach, you know, you're not your body, and happiness comes by service, not not by sense gratification. And they actually preach very well. So as far as they go, they're really very faithful to Prabhupada's teachings. And, and, and they do it well. You know, they have intelligent people, and they, they actually preach well. Uh, but it just, you know, it, it just gets kind of decapitated at a certain point. So that we're not, they're not confused with the Hare Krishna movement. But what's interesting here, here's the real point. If you look at Kirtanananda, if you look at Siddhasarupananda, if you look at Paul the Apostle, it's just, it's, it's in, you know, among devotees there's all this amateurism. Oh, that's, you know, you're like the Christians, or you're like Kirtananda, you're like this or that. And the people who are making these accusations just know very little about the actual history. One good thing about going to college, one good thing about it is, that you actually get trained to think logically and to give evidence for what you say. So I think probably the most valuable thing about, and you know, Jennifer, you can confirm what I say, otherwise don't say anything. <laughs> that is that, um, you know, many people, it's often been said the most valuable thing about an academic program, especially like a doctoral program, is not just the information you get, because anyone could just read it in a book, but what's really valuable is that you learn intellectual discipline. You learn intellectual discipline. I mean, Gandini, she's a, actually a celebrated scholar. Smile, Gandini. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> and so you, you learn that you can't just say something. You have to give evidence. For, and Arya also got her PhD a few years ago. Arya, smile. From Australia, came all the way from. She's came the farthest distance to attend this August, November, August, November celebration. So, but you learn that you learn intellectual discipline. You can't just say something. And so, if you say you're like Kirtananda, you're like Siddha Sarup, you're like, um, you know, Apostle Paul, do you actually know the history? Do you actually know what you're talking about? And so among people who are not academically trained, uh, the level of discourse tends to be really sloppy. Which makes my job much easier. <laughs> Actually, I'm kind of grateful that it is. So I can... Yes? What if people that are in management like this, would you say, for example, like, well, our junior was told that he should just keep fighting because that's his duty, that's his dharma. Yeah, but he wasn't supposed to fight the Brahmins. That's not the point. Arjun didn't go and shoot arrows. At, well, it's you could say that Duryodhana was a Brahmin and Ashwatthama, and they were fighting, but they weren't fighting for management. I'm not fighting to manage anything. I'm not interfering with their management. I'm not disputing that they're supposed to manage. To say that a government is mediocre is not to say it's illegitimate. I'm not trying to take over ISKCON. I'm not trying to... In fact, when I traveled around Europe and other countries, uh, I, I, I made the point over and over and over again that I don't want to even know anything about the local management. I'm not interested. I'm not telling you what to do on a practical level. No one left their service because of me. No one... I didn't tell any temple you should change the way the temple works. I very strictly, very chastely, very conscientiously kept myself separate from management. And rather what I explained is history, philosophy, social science, and I absolutely did not interfere with management. So your example would be like, you know, it'd be like the, like Arjun saying, wait a second, leaving the battlefield, you know, riding his chariot 20 miles down the road to a Brahmin ashram and shooting some of the Brahmins with his arrows. Oh, sorry, Sarah. That's okay. I have a question. Um, the wife of Abraham. 
<laughs> but one quick, this is not my question, but Siddha's group on Sundays, they do on Ocean Avenue, they do a little chanting thing, free mantra meditation. What are they chanting? Sometimes I join them, they chant like Gorni Thai, and they always give me like weird looks because I think they know I'm... Yeah, if you're just a member of this con, you're like the enemy. Yeah. But my question, um, you said we need to become a recognized world religion. So I'm just wondering historically what makes something cross over from like cult or, you know, fringe to uh, become a historical religious movement. Because like Jehovah's Witness has the organization and the numbers, but they're not philosophically accepted as, you know, a world religion. So do we need to get like to the scholars? Uh, They're not... Well, I don't think there's any such thing as being philosophically accepted. Mm. I mean, the world doesn't care about philosophy, basically. But there's no scholar. I, I mean, your point, there's no scholarly um, presentation that can be Yeah, like most people think it's for like... What? For what? For Jehovah's No, but that's not... I mean, there's no scholarly presentation to be made for the Southern Baptists. <clears throat> I mean, it's... But it's... Uh, I think what has to be done is... Of course, it's ultimately the power is in the spiritual, it's in the holy name and the Bhagavad Gita, Prabhupada's teachings. But so I would say something which is necessary but not sufficient is that we cannot be perceived by most people in the society as being crazy, weird, strange, comical. <coughs> we just can't be perceived that way. You cannot, you cannot keep your. Basically, Iskon has built a high wall of separation between ourselves and society. Because in the beginning days of the movement, we were neophytes, you know, we were frightened by the material world. So culturally, ISKCON built this high wall of separation. So it saves us from the non-devotees, but it also saves the non-devotees from us. As I always say, ISKCON, you know, society is a headless body, but ISKCON is a disembodied head. And so when the head gets separated from the body, it's the head that has to figure out how to make the connection. The world can't figure out how to connect to ISKCON. The world has zero interest in connecting to ISKCON. We are the ones that have to figure out how to make the connection. But, you know, it's very interesting. Even though Prabhupada, you know, I think it's 1919 in the Bhagavatam, 4854, where both these verses in the Bhagavatam have the phrase, Deshakala Vibhagavit, which means literally knowing the differences of time and place. And his purports to there, and other, like, like uh, Madhya Leela, chapter 23, verse 105, Prabhupada emphasized again and again, you have to adapt, you have to adjust, you have, you have to do what is convenient. He keeps using this word convenient, what is comfortable, what is convenient for the Western people. And yet we have this conservative image, this macho Prabhupada, that, you know, this is the way we dress, this is the way we cook, if you don't like it, say hello to Yamaraj. <laughs> you little carmy bastard. It's just, you know, you've got this, you've got this macho Prabhupada that, you know, won't lift a finger to save anyone. I don't learn anything. I don't adjust anything. And, 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 and obviously, what you have is, you have devotees who think that way, who are grossly lording it over the non-devotees, who are using the superiority of our teachings to just lord it over non-devotees and to recreate Prabhupada in their image as Prabhupada just kind of like lording it over the world. And the idea that a pure devotee who's an ocean of mercy, an ocean of mercy, will not make, will not lift a finger to save suffering souls. You know, I, I put in that paper I wrote, this quote from Prabhupada, where Prabhupada said, if I have to change my dress in order to save these people, I will do it immediately. But that pop, see, that Prabhupada's not popular because that Prabhupada doesn't feed our own vanity. It doesn't feed our own egotism, thinking we're better than everyone else's devotees. It's the Prabhupada that says, I don't change anything. You have to change. That's the Prabhupada that's become famous in ISKCON. And so when you see, you know, when you see how the Hare Krishna movement has filtered Prabhupada and some very powerful statements that Prabhupada makes are ignored forgotten, never, they never made the tops of the pops. You know, it never, it never made the charts. Prabhupada over and over and over again expressed how eager he was to make concessions on external things in order to save people. And those, all those statements, and there's so many of them, 
were just filtered out of the Hare Krishna movement. And every statement were, that has swagger and sort of macho, and I didn't come to learn a damn thing. I just came to tell everybody what to do. Yay, Jai Prabhupada. That's the Prabhupada that everybody loves. And so if you look at this heavy filtering process, it tells you much more about our psychology than it does about Prabhupada. And so we need to start asking these questions. Like, what's wrong with us? Why have we created this artificial Prabhupada? Why have we filtered out the very statements he made that tell us how to make the movement work in 2015? The very statements that will save the Hare Krishna movement in the Western world are the ones that were filtered out, forgotten, rejected. So we really need to, you know, because we don't have a culture of self-criticism. We don't have a culture of, because I think that, our, you know, frankly, we have a lot of senior devotees who are not heavily inclined to self-criticism. Mm -hmm. And if they're not going to criticize themselves, God help you if you criticize them. So, rather than just, you know, engaging in our favorite pastime of trashing the Western world and trashing the non-devotees, it's just like when I started Krishna West, I got all this uh, criticism from senior devotees. West, what do you mean West? That's mundane. You know, why not Krishna North or South? Actually, as one sannyasi said, <laughs> you know, first of all, I, you know, someone, had to, someone has to tell this person there is no such thing as Northern culture. <laughs> There's no such thing as Southern culture. And so all these the people... What? The South disagree. Well, yeah, yeah, I understand what you're saying. So, but what's interesting is they would criticize it's mundane to say Krishna West, and yet... They forgot Prabhupada's pranam mantra. Prabhupada uses the word West in his own pranam mantra. Paschatya Deshatarine. And so people think it's somehow offensive and mundane to single out the West as being especially important. Yeah, that's what Prabhupada did. And everyone, you know, that's the little, I call it the bliss bubble. Everyone lives in the bliss bubble. Where you see these, you know, you, you know, you see these on YouTube. You can see as many as you want. Devotees go out on Hari Nam. They're they're in the bliss bubble. They're ecstatic. They're chanting, dancing. The public is not interested. The public is walking by. People are like, ooh. And, and yet the devotees are just in ecstasy. They really think they're winning. They really think they're winning. And the, and the reason they think they're winning is because of one of the major philosophical mistakes in the Hari Krishna movement which is the exaggerated importance given to a Gyata Sukriti. You know, unknown good deed. Prabhupada said, you know, if they just touch a book, if they just eat prasadam, or if they just hear the holy name, yes, there's benefit. Is there enough benefit to make the movement work? It seems there isn't. What about Bhagavad Gita 1728? Ashadaya hutam tattam tapas a tongue twister. Tapastaptam kritangcha jat asarit yuchate parata nachatad neha nachatad pratyanoiha. Any religious activity, any religious activity which is performed without faith does not give much result in this life or the next. How can you believe in something you don't know? I mean, think about that. Can you believe in something you don't know? And so agyata means unknown. How much benefit? Rupa Goswami says in the Upadeshamrita that if you think the results of bhakti yoga, you know, niyamagraha, are automatic and mechanical, that will destroy your devotion. And so the entire strategy of the Hare Krishna movement in the Western world is based on an idea which Krishna rejects and which Rupa Goswami says destroys bhakti. It is what you could call, and I don't mean this jokingly, I mean this is actually the technical term, bhakti mimangsa. Karma mimangsa means the results of karma come automatically, bhakti mimangsa. But Prabhupada did say there's benefit. There is benefit. But it's, if you look at Shastra, what you find is the benefit of a Gyata Sukriti is always just a little extra thing. Take the case of a Jamila. 
In the sixth canto, where it talks so much about how he got, you know, was just by chanting unknowingly the holy name. The life of a Jamila simply demonstrates the truth of Krishna's statement in chapter 2 of Bhagavad Gita, Neha Bikramanashosti. There's no loss or diminution. A Jamila, everyone says Ajamil, which sounds like a Vedic breakfast cereal. <laughs> when I get up, I take Ajamil. <laughs> So, um, anyway, so in the case, Ajamila had, was actually an advanced Vaishnava. And because he chanted, he was simply restored to the position he had earned by conscious chanting. His actual advancement was made not unconsciously. Ajamila's actual advancement was made consciously by Bhakti Yoga. But then he fell down. And so the Vishnu Dutas put him back in the position that he had earned by conscious bhakti yoga. So you have this perfect storm of dysfunctionality where the devotees go out and believe that it's just automatic, it's mechanical. That whether the public likes or doesn't like what we're doing is absolutely irrelevant. It's absolutely irrelevant because it's automatic. I have a question. Yes, Sarah. yes. What would be? What would you suggest as a good step forward? Uh, what kind of things? Would respect non-devotees, take them seriously, and do Hari Nam in a way that actually they like. What about things like you know businesses? Are you, how you think go forward? Like you think of businesses or Banashram or. How are we supposed to develop so that we can actually... Well, frankly, uh, if we were making devotees, we would have that problem. In other words, if we had money, let's say like in the old days, I remember when I had a big zone, back in the days when Prabhus were Prabhus, when Maharajas were Maharajas, I remember that, um, I mean, we had money, we had men and, or women, we had people. And so if we wanted to do something, we just did it because we had staff, we had, we had resources. The thing is, right now, there's, we have, there's nothing to decide because who has discretionary capital? Who has, like, yeah, I've got some extra really intelligent devotees that want to do something, you know? You want me to send them over there to help you? Who's got that? So I think, it, I, I think if we start, God himself reciprocates. Vijay quote that verse. Yes, God him if we don't respect the non devotees, why are they gonna respect us? Do you think they know do you think they don't know we don't respect them? <laughs> do, you, do you think they're really that stupid that they don't know that we could not care less what they think? That when we go out in Harinam, if they think we're strange or they don't feel comfortable and we could not care less. You think they don't know that? If you walk into a room and someone in that room doesn't care about you, don't you know it? The non-devotees are reciprocating our complete contempt for them. We care about non-devotees only as a philosophical category. Save the fallen souls. Yeah, also we don't, I think many, many world religions are very successful because they care about the well-being of those. Much more, in, yeah. In all respect, we care about the soul. Caring the soul and everything else, let it collapse, don't worry about it. We do have um, those hospice <laughs> things coming up now. What is uh, it? <laughs> who is it here that, someone had a question here? Right? Can I ask something? Mm -hmm. Ix oh, oh, I'm sorry, first Swargi yeah. and then oh. Ikshwaku. Oh. Thanks, Ikshwaku. Thanks. Yes. We should use the F word, fruit of worker. Yes.
that all the devotees were over there and were inside the temple. And I was just curious, like, what, because obviously the mode was, it was, it was like, not of the devotees, but, like, how would you, how, are you, how could you even respond to a comment? Like, what I would say is, number one, there is something a little <laughs> awful about it, but where does the awfulness lie? In other words, you could say, isn't it awful that a temple treats people in such a way that they don't want to come to the temple? I mean, that's like saying, if you run a corporation, you're selling so some all the product. people that are going to the program, they come to the temple. They all come to the temple. Yeah, they all come to the temple. It's just that one particular night, there's prasadam. Yeah. Every, every night. Every, every night. Yeah, they were, they've been, and, and that's sort of a plan, like that's a plan that someone has done to have householders have the program. It's something they started a few years ago. Every night, doing Kartik, some devotee, right near the temple there, just across the street. Oh, well, that's fine. Somewhere else. Yeah, so what's the problem? Do you see a problem with that, Vijay? No problem, Vijay does not see a problem with it. What? <laughs> <laughs> and that's why it's like, but why is that a bad thing? That so, the the person that said that, that was a little, you know... Little yeah, problem. just because one person said something. I think that particular devotee made the same comment to me, and I see that he had, he sells a particular, uh, how do you say, purpose that benefits himself. Yeah. That's, I knew that. So, yeah, just because one person says something doesn't make yeah. it an issue. So, Ishwaku? Yeah, you were explaining that. And then, then maybe we'll, we'll take some time off. And, yeah. But am I neglecting the disease by going to someone's program? Prabhupada constantly went to home programs. If you look at Prabhupada in India, that's all he ever did. He went every day to home programs. But he also said, right, that the devotees that live near a temple should support the temple program. And yes, and the leaders of the temple should support the devotees. Yeah. Yeah. There should so be an atmosphere where everyone feels valued. Yeah. And, you know, people... It's interesting because Prabhupada said that Los Angeles, he specifically said it should be a place where people are trained to go out all around the world as leaders. And so we can count how many leaders were trained in, in Los Angeles in the last 30 years to go out and spread the movement. Anyway, I'll let you come up with your own numbers. So, so I, I, I think it, 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 it's not just a question... It's not just a question... Yeah, the temples are the temples. But it's also a question we're competing for their hearts and minds... Of, this, of, of, of conditioned souls, whether they're devotees or not devotees. And so it seems to me the attitude of a temple should be constantly trying to do a better job, constantly trying to be more attractive, make people more comfortable, have, make them feel more empowered, more responsible. You see what I mean? It, it, it has to be a reciprocal thing. You, yes. were, you were explaining that when Prabhupada came, plan A was to preach to intelligent cultural people. Yes. And plan B was what, what yes. happened. So that I was wondering, why is that if uh, Srila Prabhupada is the pure instrument, Krishna's pure instrument, why didn't Krishna sanction to... Because the circumstances him? matter. What was it? What was it? Well, he said if Prabhupada question. came to, to uh, uh, you know, reach... Mm -hmm leading people or he, want, or he wanted to reach leading people important people you know why didn't what happened with Krishna obviously Krishna had some plan but at the same time Prabhupada um, you know as he often said was in a foreign country for example Prabhupada wrote letters to the great foundations Ford Foundation Carnegie Foundation saying that you should give support you should support us because we're teaching about God but if if you read the statutes of all these corporations, one of the first points is they do not give money to religious organizations. And so actually when Prabhupada came here, he his, his goal was to attract intelligent people in these Western countries who understood their countries and who could then figure out a way to bring those people. So, so you know, that's what Prabhupada said, like a moon, you know, looking for the moon. So, not just stars. So it's our responsibility. It's our responsibility, those of us who live in this country. Prabhupada never, you know, it's interesting. I always had this romantic idea that Prabhupada really was living in New York, he was living in America. But even if you listen to his lectures, even if you, even if you listen to Prabhupada's lectures in 1966, Prabhupada would often say, in New York, I live in Brindavan. My home is in Brindavan. I'm visiting your country. So Prabhupada basically came to America, went to England, went to all these countries, France, Germany, whatever, 
trying to find intelligent, qualified people who could save their country. For example, I, I developed the movement in Brazil. And, you know, it was very successful by, by Krishna's arrangement. But there's no way in the world I'm ever going to understand Brazil the way intelligent Brazilians do. Or Ixhuacu is from Mexico. <laughs> and so, you know, he's very successful. He's in Leon, Mexico. And I can't, it's just not, you know, at a certain age, I'm not going to spend years of my life, you know, watching all the, you know, reruns of Mexican TV shows and, you know, Mexican movies and really understand the culture and, you know, watch like the last 20 years of Mexican commercials to see what the cultural assumptions are. So this image of Prabhupada as someone who was materially infallible, who knew everything, Prabhupada thought it was a stupid idea. You know, devotee kept asking Prabhupada about some material thing. Prabhupada said, how do I know? I'm not God. Prabhupada was asked directly, does a pure devotee know everything? And Prabhupada said, that's ridiculous. It's only Krishna. So the point is that it is our responsibility to find a way to make this movement work in this country or in your country. That's our responsibility. But to do that, we have to have a culture in ISKCON where thinking is not the fifth sinful activity. <laughs> I mean, I was told by a prominent ISKCON leader, temple president, that I don't want the devotees in this temple thinking too much. I just want them to work. In other words, he wanted sudras, not brahmas. Yes. <laughs> well, in the short term, you get everyone cooperating seemingly that with that strategy, and in the long term, it never there's grows. A culture of, of respect where you can actually create that house I was talking about that pop up. And it never grows. There's room for everybody to have. Yes. And not everyone can suck up to that for very long, you know. It doesn't grow. No, it doesn't. It doesn't grow. It never grows. Anyway, thank you all very much for le allowing me to harass you on these points. <laughs> and, but my, I mean, ultimately, the whole point is just saving this planet and, and fulfilling. You know, we chant, Pasyatya Deshacharni. Did anyone but me notice that it didn't happen? What didn't happen? Saving the Western countries. No, I didn't. She wants, she wants to start a green West. No, green Krishna West. Green. Krishna <laughs> Green. Krishna. Yeah, Krishna <laughs> Green. It's our duty to Prabhupada, it's our duty to the world, it's our duty to other souls to, uh, you know, we all have to work together to find a way to get this movement going. We need a relevant, powerful, Western Hare Krishna movement. And everything else, frankly, is less important. I mean, obviously, take care of your health. I mean, you should be physically healthy, mentally, intellectually, spiritually healthy. Our first duty is to be healthy, as I hope your mother taught you. But apart from being healthy, uh, our duty is to make this movement work. And everything else is really kind of trivial. If you see the big picture. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.